Welcome to the Daily Examiner. My name is Elliot Ikile. This tonight is because we had so many requests to have it done. We were asked time and time and time to confront the issues around youth and family and to get the, the man himself, Bob McCrossey, on the air. We thank you so much for all of the support that we've had. We want to thank you all those who have donated to the site. This is a direct cause of what you've been able to do. So thank you very much on that. I want to get stuck in because we've got a lot to talk about and we might even go past the hour from what I hear. So just some quick housekeeping. If you do want to engage, this is going to be a an interactive corridor, an interactive discussion. Please chuck in your comments, questions. Uh, as we go on, we will attempt to answer, respond to as many as we can do. We'll bring it into the discussion. Really, really important, really, really vital. So thank you for joining in. Thank you for joining in. And first, let me introduce my co-host for this evening. This is Mel Taylor. Mel, good day. How are Hi. you? Good, good. Big shout out to you, Elliot, because um, I'm pretty sure we started on time. 
<laughs> hey, hey, I'm I am I am Islander, therefore timing and punctuality is very strong. You'll find that Bob McCoskey's wife is, is also of a very strong lineage uh, as well. Uh, so, cool bananas. Without further ado, please welcome to the stage the man, the director of Family First. He has been fighting the fight for families and for everything that you can think of in terms of conservatism for so many years. He has exposed so much drama. He has brought attention, not just nationally, but internationally to things going on in this country to our children, to our families. So without further ado, let me welcome Bob McCossery to the stage. Bob, g'day. Hey, uh, nice to be with you guys. In the words of my wife, Fakalofa Layatu. I think I got that right. Fakalofa Layatu. My wife is half Nuwayan, so my kids are quarter Nuwayan. So, uh, man, you know, we love the island food. I love all food, but we love the island food as well. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, we do hear that uh, Bob has a bit of a weakness for KFC. Very much uh, that wonderful chicken aspect. Lovely, very lovely. It's from the islands, so, isn't it? It is from the islands. <laughs> hey, thank you. <laughs> All right. Look, thank you so much for jumping in. Thank you so much for uh, speaking with us tonight. Uh, now, I, I also want to put in here Mel Taylor. I'm not sure if she would say this, but Mel Taylor has dealt with some of the most severe cases of at-risk youth and high-risk, at-risk and vulnerable youth in the country. She's dealt with them at a very deep level, very much people who normal interventions and processes will not work for. So that's where Mel comes in, into it as well. And so we've got we've really got some powerful live lived experts on this panel so again i want to bring in any of the uh people talking about anything here bring it out there and we'll try to bring it out there right so we've got a youth crime issue there's been a massive spike and skyrocketing youth crime ram raids we, we've just heard the latest that a couple of 17 year olds and 15 year olds have been arrested uh, these people, these young people are being arrested. They're not like uh, running away too well or anything like that. Uh, we want to talk about different cases, but I want to have a look at this youth spike, this youth crime wave first and uh, get your guys' opinion as to where it comes from and what's going on. But uh, Bob, what do you think? Where is this coming from? Well, what you tend to get especially with young people is that you get uh, copycat you get peer pressure you sort of get the deer and uh, people want to mimic what others are doing and getting away with and so what we've done is we've probably created the perfect storm because we've given the perception unfortunately for the police but the head of you know the hierarchy of the police have sort of taken this softly softly approach uh, we've seen that with gangs and of course gangs are exploding in numbers uh, and so what young people see is this kind of, uh, well, they're going to go soft on me. Um, you know, I might get uh, in trouble. I might get in trouble. I have to go to see a counsellor or something like that. But, uh, you know, I've always felt that human nature is important. Uh, I always remember the classic line when we were discussing the anti-smacking law back in 2007, and I was actually on radio and I interviewed Helen Clark at the time, who was pushing through the law. And I said, you know, uh, look, we want to deal with serious child abuse, but do you want to ban smacking, non-abusive smacking? And she said, uh, and it was her famous quote, no, that would defy human nature. And I think, you know, I mean, she was dead right. What we're getting at here is that young people do respond to clear boundaries and consequences. Uh, when I was involved with Youth for Christ, we used to take kids away on teen safaris which would be a week-long camp. And one of the most important things we did at the beginning of the camp was we set out what the rules were, whether they would be enforced, and who would enforce them. Once those three things are established, kids feel safe. They feel like there's uh, boundaries and, you know, uh, they're going to be protected. And then they get on and really enjoy the camp. And mm. unfortunately, we've taken away a lot of that because we've declawed parents uh we've undermined parents rights and so kids are basically saying well you you know mum and dad you can't tell me to go to school you can't stop me going out with my mates late at night so we've created this perfect storm and now we wonder gee what's going wrong what have we done wrong well we could have told them about uh you know 15 years ago that they were heading down the wrong track uh and of course mal was involved in 
some of these campaigns and can probably echo what I've been saying. Mm. Mm. Mel, what's your take? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why not? This is what a lot of you think, you know, why are you doing this crime? Why are you stealing cars? Why are you whatever? Um, why not? There are no consequences for actions. They are so empowered nowadays and parents and authority figures are disempowered. Um, there's not a lot anyone in authority, the word authority and, and the meaning behind it's gone out the window. And this is the fallout from years and years of really, really bad policies that have taken away the rights of the parents, the rights, you know, for the police. Um, this is the fallout. It's devastating. And is it going to get better? Not in a hurry. There yeah. is years and years of bad policies to undo. Um, and a lot of good parents um, have fallen for being good good parents. They've been, they've been punished. So what was acceptable, you know, 15, 20 years ago, goodness me, no way now. Um, parents mm. are scared. That's just ridiculous. And, and kids pick up on that. And when you don't have loving and firm boundaries, um, kids don't feel safe. They feel out of control and they go and act accordingly. All right. Wow. So you, both of you are bringing up family structure. You're both bringing up parents and parenting. However, I, you know, Thar Al Fano reports. There was a report that was written for the government that doesn't state that Fano is a or family is a, a preventative measure. You've also got the Children's Commissioner today who spoke about families actually suffering from they need more benefits, they need more welfare, that they are poor kids, and that's actually the main area. So you're you're finding that a lot of the authorities are saying are not talking about family structure. They're not talking about parenting. Have they got a point? Is this actually not to do with parenting? Is this actually to do with we need to give them more benefits and uh, we need to put them in more rugby games and, and more free stuff? Uh, that's the situation that government 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 based officials are sort of saying. What is your take on that, Bob? Well, it's the government basically saying that they're a better parent than the parent, and uh, so the state wants to take control. So the state will look after your kids before they go to school. They'll indoctrinate your kids at school with um, certain radical ideologies that they don't tell parents about or or don't disclose to them. Uh, they, you know, they'll keep secret uh, things secret from parents and and sneak them off for an abortion uh, and teach them radical ideologies. They'll teach them that you know if you're white, you got issues, and um, you know you are part of the problem. And so, uh, in effect, the state is becoming the mummy and daddy of our children. And it's time we took back ownership of our own children and started to be proactive and actually saw some of these state-run programs as, as hostile to families um, because they're pushing their own agenda. Actually, I did a McBlog today. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but yesterday was the UN International Day of Families. Uh, which you probably right. didn't hear about because the media didn't talk about it. I found one article on it in the Rotorua Daily Post about some nice little thing happening at the community centre, little art display, but the mainstream media weren't interested in it. Of course, I found lots of examples of the International Women's Day, but not the International Day of Families. Uh, and yet we're a signatory to this uh, UN document, which was signed in 2015, which talks about sustainable goals and talks about social development and and the and the UN talks about the fact that uh, solid strong families and family structure is a key to better education keeping kids safe um, growing economies and yet there's a there's a blockage in the mind of our powers that be in New Zealand they don't want to acknowledge a traditional family. They've done everything they can to undermine it. They've redefined basic things like marriage. They've undermined parental rights in terms of just raising kids. And so parents are on the back foot and they don't actually know what they're allowed to do now. And the message to kids is, well, you may be my biological parents, but uh, you can't tell me what to do. Uh, I'll go to whatever message I like. And then you wonder why kids are stressed 
and why they're just not coping at the moment and why the mental health of young people is going uh, through the roof. It, it's so sad to see. Uh, and, I, you know, I just want to encourage mums and dads and grandparents to take back the ownership of your children and start to be the loudest voice in their lives. Because if you allow the state and the morals of the groups that the state endorses, uh, then you're going to find that there's going to be issues. Well said. Well said, uh, Mel. You have a you have children in the education system, or you've had. Uh, tell us, is Bob sort of saying what is accurate in there? Are there ideologies starting to be pushed upon our children? The ideas of racism and grooming is that occurring from what you've heard and seen? Oh, absolutely, absolutely! It's happening through th throughout the place. It's, and it's not only. I mean, there are a lot of people out there that think that this this gender ideology or this grooming, whatever it may, you know, however you may look at it, they think, oh, it must be starting, I guess, in secondary school with the sex education programs. Um, that is not reality. Reality is, it's it's starting as young as they can start it. It is in the primary schools. It. It's, it's everywhere. Um, parents, you are your child's foundation. You need to make sure that the values and the morals that you want your child to have come from you, not from the state. Because look at how, I mean, the more state involvement we have, look at how it's working out. It's proving itself. The stats are there. Mm. It's, um, yeah. But there is some really damaging stuff coming out um, in all the schools for all ages. Mm, well said. Well and said. I think, um, uh, uh, Elliot, if I can just say, look, I noticed a comment coming through saying, well, you know, I don't have to smack my kids, uh, but they're not committing ram raids. Look, th that's the exact point. You're right. It, it's not about the right to smack. What that law did was basically said that the state knows better how to raise your kids than parents do. Uh, and any parent knows that you have a number of tools in the toolbox and they work with certain kids. For, so, for some of my kids, time out uh, alone, they hated and it was a great thing. For others, it was not allowed, you know, been grounded or not allowed to go with friends or it was withdrawal of certain privileges. For others, the short smack on the, on the backside was the, the reboot that they needed uh, just to get them back on track. And and so you don't wake up thinking, gee, I want to discipline my kid today. You actually want them to behave, but what you do is you realise that under human nature, you've got to have consequences and they need to work. And those are the same consequences that we want in our society. So I want to know that when, for example, gang members are selling drugs to young children outside schools, that there is going to be strong consequences to deter that behaviour, um, you know, that's that's the type of consequences that you want and that the law is going to be enforced. And I think we're going through a stage where we're taking this softly, softly approach and 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 we're paying the dividends of it. I noticed one other comment just asking about the, um, am I okay to comment on these comments that are coming through? Go for through, it, Alan? absolutely, you know go for it. I saw somebody asking about the Keeping Ourselves Safe program. I'd encourage you just to look at Family First Dot NZ, and we've uh, profiled that program along with other sex education programs in your school. Look under Family Matters, and you'll see my episode on that. Look, the Keeping Ourselves Safe program, for example, police program talks about uh, you know simple safety type things, the type of things that probably we we all talk to our kids about about you know not getting in cars with strangers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But but part of the problem is that they also get right into the gender ideology. And so tutors and keeping ourselves safe are told not to refer to mum and dad. Uh, they're also told that they can't talk about um, boys having penises and girls having vaginas because there may be some boys that don't, believe it or not. I mean, I'm not quite sure about what biology that's based on, but you'll see those exact quotes in um, our analysis of the... Uh, sexuality and gender education. And so our advice to parents is get in first, be the loudest voice, find out what the curriculum is. And look, here's a warning for parents. If your school is not open about the curriculum around anything like 
sexuality, education, gender ideology, critical race theory, if they're not open and transparent, that's an immediate red flag and you need to withdraw your children and you can under the Education and Training Act, you have the right to withdraw your children um, based on your personal beliefs. So all that information is, is on our website. And look, I want to encourage parents to be a bit more suspicious of what the state is trying to indoctrinate our kids with. I heard one uh, one of you guys use the word grooming. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty strong word. Um, I'm not sure that it's necessarily grooming. I just think that there is a cultural ideology being driven by the radical left that is being pushed on our kids. Look, if they want to push it on us as adults, then so be it. We've got the kahunas to to deal with it and, you know, analyze it. But we're talking about gender ideology that, for example, family planning wants to start on kids as young as seven and eight years old to tell them that there's more than two genders and that mummy and daddy may have made a mistake when they called you a boy or a girl. We've got to push back about that, push back on that type of stuff. Well said, well said. I, uh, I want to know, okay, so I want to just uh, close up the current spike because I do want to have most of our discussion around what's happening in our schools that have been done to our children just to just to lean off, uh, finish up on terms of the crime, the crime wave that's going on, and we, I'm sure, we expect the others. What's going to happen with these young people in terms of what you know of SIFs or Oranga Tamariki? What's going to happen with these young people? Are they going to receive a strong deterrent, or are they going to be funded for things and do what that strength-based approach stuff and just basically be given anything that they want? What do you? What is your opinion of what's going to happen with these kids? Were you asking me, or were you asking Mal, the specialist in this area? I'll go. I'll go to Mal first because Mal. Yeah, has a and then I can copy her understanding of, of this. <laughs> That's actually a really, really sad question, with an even sadder answer. Um, as it stands, what? Can they do? Everyone's expecting Oranga Tamariki to step up and and do everything they can. But as we were saying before, we're living in this this new society where kids are empowered and and adults and authority is disempowered. So you can run all the programs you want for a youth. You can send them here. You can put them in whatever placement they need to be in that's really good for them. The reality is if they're going to run or if they want to do drugs, they want to go hang out with their mates in the streets, there is nothing anybody can do. They can return them back to a placement and what happens, they just run again. Um, it's a never-ending battle at the moment. It all, I mean, there's always been youth that have absconded. We've had youth abscond from our, from our care, from all caregivers have, uh, but it is getting pretty bad now. Um, and then, of course, you know, Kids are so empowered. We, we've had kids that have come in and said, if you don't do what I want, when I want, and don't let, allow me to, you know, do whatever, then I'm just, I'll lay a false allegation against you. Um, and it's the type of job where you're actually guilty until proven innocent. So that's how empowered these kids are. And they can go and do all of the crimes, Um what do they get? There's there's no consequences. And, and FGC, um, <laughs> it's the system is so broken. We're not Sorry, even. Mel, what, what is an FGC? Just for our people out there who don't know, a family group conference, and it's where the family get together and any other services that have been involved with the youth or young person, and they all come up with a plan. Um, a plan is great. Sometimes it's a little weird having a very broken, dysfunctional family coming up with decisions. Sometimes there's amazing family and the youth just doing what he wants to do. Um, yeah, family group conferences are interesting because you can put all the plans you want in place and everyone wants the best for their child. Um, well, the majority of people do. But that doesn't matter. mean that the plan stuck to, not at all. Absolutely not at all. They've got probably three to six monthly reviews. Um, 
the older the youth, the more the trouble, the less likely any of that plan is ever going to come to fruition. And it's always the ambulance at the top of the cliff. The problem is the families. It starts with the family. Um, kids are a product of, of their, their environment. They're, they're susceptible, susceptible, excuse me, to everything that goes on in their environment from a young age. So if there's drugs and alcohol and abuse, then, you know, breaking free of that is not going to be easy. We're putting all these resources up the top and the reality need, is that it needs to be with the families right in the beginning. Mm. Mm. Well said, well said. Uh, for, I think for, yeah, it, it, I suspect what will happen to those guys who are commenting right now that what you'll find is that they'll be taken off, done over with youth aid. There'll be some sort of strength-based approach, and FGC will take effect. In that, you know, they'll they might write a letter or something like that, and they'll go I straight back. Apology. Yeah, letter. There'll be a letter of apology, some sort of uh, uh, RJ. I think restorative justice is still being used, is it? I, I believe. Um, yeah, it. With, with the letter of apology, I, I just I'll quickly approach that because it's um, ridiculous. So sometimes you're ordered to do a letter of an apology to the victims. Um, they get given a letter by the court that steps out. Basically, it's just like fill in the blanks with your name, your date of birth and your hobbies, and that's it. It's pretty much done for them. I mean, well, how sorry, do you now, uh, sorry, are you saying that there's a, a type of a, a, a type of template for yes. an apology that the yes. young person just puts in their little details? And then that gets put forward as, as an authentic apology from the young person to their victim. That's correct. There, there is a template. Just make sure you put this, this, what you did, you're sorry, and whatever other details. But, yeah, it's not a from the heart type thing at all. It's a just make sure you've ticked these boxes on the template and away we go. I think that's extraordinary. Uh, and, look, I, I would... I know this gets a little bit controversial, but I, I think it's a bit tough because I know that when I've dealt with social workers before, when it comes to their young people, basically the young person just needs to say, oh, I want a bike or I want to go to this course or I want to go to, I want to have this and this and this. And the social worker just throws it at them. They go to their own little funding uh, situation. They, they put it in and then they magically get it, which I think has a real twisted effect on the capacity to, uh, to uh, uh, link items and objects that are not yours with things with things that are other people's or, or any sort of payment. So I think that is actually quite quite problematic. Uh, I think it's also quite tragic that the the idea of an apology is not is, is, is in a template form. I think that's just I think that's just shocking, absolutely shocking. Um, hey, can I ask a question? I mean Bob, you were a social worker um, back in the day, not very long ago. Um, what changes have you seen like that have dramatic since you were in social work? Well, I think part of uh, what's missing from this whole debate, which I haven't seen a lot around, take, for example, the ram raids of uh, young children, is that there doesn't seem to be a lot of discussion about why are these kids out late at night? Who's actually supervising them? Where are the parents? Why are the parents not taking responsibility? Uh, how do we make them take responsibility? What's happening in the family that's caused this type of breakdown? Uh, look, is it mental illness? Is it drug and alcohol abuse? Uh, is it, you know, a parent that is really just struggling to cope? Um, I mean, when I was working with families, you know, often you'd find, especially, uh, and this is no slight on them because I think they're doing a fantastic job, but solo mums do it, especially when they're, uh, younger kids become teenagers and stronger because uh, basically, you know, they're in charge. They tell mum what to do, not the other way around. And so that's where the mentoring program, um, those those types of uh, resources that can support those parents. So I, I would, I really want to go back to the source. When I when I first got into youth work we tended to focus on running programs for young people. But I I actually ended up setting up an organisation uh, which worked with the whole family with a holistic approach because what would happen is we would take kids away for a week that enjoy the boundaries, that enjoy the structure, that enjoy the fact that we just loved them to bits and, you know, gave them a really good week. 
um, and and but then they would go home to the exact same um, problem that they were facing before they came. And so I realised that if we want to see results, we've actually got to go into these families, whole families, extended families, find out whether there's extended family that can support these parents. Um, let me let me just give you one example of uh, let's let's just look at child abuse and the stats around child abuse. Unfortunately, for Maori, they are disproportionately represented uh, in the child abuse stats. Now, some people could say, well, that's that's because they're a violent culture. See, I don't buy that. If you drill down into the stats on Maori child abuse, what you do is you find that unfortunately. Uh, Māori have very disproportionately low marriage rates. They also have um, high teenage pregnancies. And so, in effect, what you've got is families that have been um, formed that um, are already struggling, already on the back foot, and then suddenly children arrive and you know, we all know what kind of pressure that is, even even uh, when we've got kind of things under control. Uh, and and so when you've got a family that uh, has already is already fragmented, and perhaps mum's got the living boyfriend, and of course a child is no there's no greater risk than a mum who has a living boyfriend and that boyfriend is changing. The risk is massive for that child to be a victim of some form of abuse. And so what you actually realise is that the reason that uh, Māori are disproportionately represented in child abuse statistics is because of the weakness of family formation. Now, what are we doing to address that? Are we talking about, uh, are we promoting marriage? Are we promoting strong families? Are we giving tax breaks to families so that they can actually spend those first three to four years, those crucial years with their children? Or are we basically saying, hey, you can work, you can pay taxes, uh, we'll look after your kids and we'll spend, uh, what is it, 1.8 billion a year on childcare. Um, and some families just don't have a choice. And I think it's about time we started um, prioritising uh, that strong family, that strong relationship at the top. And that was that's one of the important points that comes out of the UN document when it talks about the International Day of Families and sustainable goals, uh, it actually alludes to the fact that uh, strong families and mum and dad, strong relationship there will actually um, improve the outcomes, not only for the adults, but also for the kids. It's not rocket science, but there's an ideology that says that marriage is so yesterday, you know, we don't want anything that even smells of Judeo-Christian values, uh, so therefore, we're going to do everything to undermine that, and they're doing a pretty good job of it. And my challenge to all the all the viewers, it's time to step up to the plate. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Well said. Well said. Uh, absolutely well said. Uh, I think that uh, there have been a couple of comments there about the military aspect. I remember that we did have the Max camps about fifteen years ago or so. And the issue that you had with the max caps, of course, is exactly what Bob is talking about, which is they'd go away for 12 weeks. They'd actually be really having lovely time uh, and they'd actually come back changed. But then they go straight back to the hood, straight to, back to the gangsters, straight back to the gangs and a family who are still struggling in their own lives. And, and so they, the, the kids just went worse. At least that was my experience when I was working in the field. So we also have... Because both of you are talking about family, family, family. But I, I want to come back to this. The Ar Alfano report says nothing about family being a preventive measure. The commissioner, the children's commissioner, does not talk about family structure or marriage rates. She moves away from it. The Heroi Mata report. Because these are reports and people who are feeding into government policy. They are not talking about family as a preventative measure of antisocial criminal behavior. They're not talking about it in terms of, of their idea of family uh, uh, being good for the community. So why? Why why are they straying away? And I want to finish here because then now I want to ask this, I want to get straight into what's happening in our schools. But uh, what is your, your, just a real brief thought as to why is it that those who are state-funded those who are under the government are actually not going to families. 
for a, as a preventative or a determining factor in the quality of a young person. Uh, Mal, why do you think first? I don't. I don't know. Probably because I don't actually get it. I mean, you've only got to look at the path that society's gone down um, since you know moving away from value, family values and, and the foundations of the family and how important it is and, and see where we're at now. It's um, it's ridiculous. They can do all the reports. There, are, there have been reports around worldwide showing the value of a functional family unit. If, if the government were to, act, to actually heavily invest in, in the family unit, they would save millions and millions and millions of dollars in jails, in youth courts, in um, addiction centres, and I, mean, I could go on all night. The, the savings would be incredible. Um, why they don't do that is just, it's beyond me. It's like there's 20 good reasons here and there's one good reason not to, so they take that. I mean, how does that even compute? Look at where we're at. Mm. Uh, well said. Yeah. Bob, what do you think? Well, the, the state doesn't want to acknowledge, um, I mean, they're moving away. They, they want to post uh, Judeo-Christian society, and uh, that means that they want to ignore marriage and the benefits. They want to ignore uh, mums and dads, so that's why gender is under attack. I mean, if you can attack gender and confuse that, then you undermine marriage, you undermine mum, dad, uh, you confuse basically the whole role of families and the nuclear family is kind of to a lot of people uh to the radical left you know family is i mean as we know black lives matter one of their uh aims which they mm -hmm. hid but was exposed is that they wanted to undermine the the traditional family because anything and, th and this is my warning anything that sniffs any any little whiff of judeo-christian values so the unborn child has a right to be born, uh, that the vulnerable are at risk of euthanasia, um, that uh, people who want to live their lives according to their uh, faith, whatever uh, religious faith or belief that is, that, that you know, they sh should not be allowed to get counselling for that. Anything that uh, sniffs of those Judeo-Christian values is directly under attack. Uh, and so, and, and really parents are part of that package so the parents that don't have a problem with these types of programs in schools generally agree with the ideology and are quite happy for the state to indoctrinate their kids with it and and don't see a problem with confusing kids about gender ideology but for 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 parents who who do believe in those values um they they really need to uh, i i think wake up and realize that the state is you know, in the old days, I think we sent our kids off to school and, and felt that the state was going to get them behind and support the parents, work with the parents. Now it feels like a them and us. And parents probably feel like, you know, they're not sure whether they can trust the school. Can they trust uh, medical professionals who may be doing stuff behind the parents' back and the parents don't need to be informed? I mean, we went through that stage even with the vaccine where kids were being told, uh, you don't need parental permission for that. I mean, that was disgraceful. But And that's just the continued message uh, that's been given to parents, that actually, parents, you're not in control. We, as a state, don't trust you really. Uh, and so we're going to have these laws, which means that the kids can come to us if they don't like what the parents are saying. That is hugely undermining. I mean, you know, it's a bit like playing a game of soccer or rugby you tell the ref what the rules are and you change them as you're going along everybody gets confused and doesn't actually know who's in charge and 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 so the state is hostile to some of those traditional values and unfortunately they're being cheered on by a compliant media which is very left-leaning uh who are uh, you know um cheering and shouting and pushing this this material. I mean, we saw an example of that last night on the Sunday program where they had this story mm. of a euthanasia case. Really tough cases. But what it what it was really about was about normalizing the right to to take your own life when you felt it was right. 
provided you can meet some conditions. But even then, that was questionable in the documentary last night. But here's the interesting thing about that documentary last night. I don't know if people saw it. They may not have. But um, they never went and interviewed a medical professional about it. They just took wow, wow. word. Yeah. Uh, and so I actually uh, contacted a few medical professionals and just asked them what their opinion of it was. Um, and, and you know, they said, look, there was information that was lacking, uh, that, that wasn't quite right. And I, I just thought in the interest of fairness, if you're going to uh, champion a law that's just come in, you... You, you you may want to present one side, but at least go and get a contra view so that people can make their decision. But unfortunately, we are dealing a media which is telling us how to think now. And that's part of the, the challenge for parents because kids uh, and some parents, um, they just feel they're being told how to think. And if they uh, think like, you know, uh, think some of these traditional values do have value and that marriage does matter and that, you know, families, strong families are where we should be putting all our energy, uh, that they'll just get shouted down. And so they tend to go quiet. And like I say, we need to find our voice again. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Stop living in fear, parents. Yeah, well said. Yeah, absolutely well said. Uh, and I think that is a, a really big one. I find, because I was the one who said uh, the grooming comment, and I do, I think the government is grooming our children. I think they're absolutely grooming our children. They are also trying to cut us up into three pieces, whether you are Māori, Pākehā or Tawiwi. Uh, I think it's absolutely disgusting what they've sort of been doing. So let's have a talk about what's in our public schools. What's happening to our children? Now, surely, though, what you're talking about is what you're talking about is uh, uh, the schooling issue from those who are in secondary school, right? Like, that's pretty bad. Is, is that is that what you're talking about? You're talking about secondary school uh, ideology soaring through our secondary school. Is that correct? No, no, I'm talking about primary. It starts uh, at... You're talking the, about uh, primary school. Primary yeah, so school. If, if you look at that um, video, which I saw you just scrolling through uh, earlier, which is on our website, so I have analysed the resources that are being part of the uh, relationships and sexuality education. Uh, purely, I just looked at primary schools. And so gender ideology is being indoctrinated into our kids from uh, year three, four onwards. Um, so year seven three, and eight-year-olds, eight they're being read stories, um, read stories uh, that you know talk about the fact that mum and dad may have got it wrong. That you you know there's not just two genders, uh, and, and are you know they, what are I they found. Johnny the Walrus. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, Johnny the Walrus is a great book on Amazon, which is a bestseller, and it's a book by Matt Walsh from Daily Wire, where he sort of does this allegory of a boy who wants to be a walrus. So they. Um, sort of the mum gets nervous that she needs to follow the son's desire to be a walrus and sort of gives gloves for the for the hands. And uh, it, it's just a very funny book. And the funny thing is that Amazon, it's one of the best sellers on Amazon. And so all the Amazon workers, the woke workers, are getting all very upset. But one of the worst things I found in the uh, family planning, uh, yeah, the Pleasure Project, um, people need to be aware of the Pleasure Project, which is a international program that some academics in New Zealand want to bring into schools, which is where you talk about not uh, sex being about educational, it's about talking dirty and talking about pleasure. Um, and the, the other thing that I found in the family planning program is that when you look at programs for seven and eight-year-olds, uh, sorry, year seven and eight, which is intermediate age, so that's about 11, 12, 13, they have a, a, a session where they talk about where you can get advice on being sexually active. They tell them that it's confidential. Uh, and remember, this is 11, 12, and 13-year-olds. Sorry, when you, so, when you say confidential, what do you mean yeah. confidential? Well, the same way that a child can get confidential advice if they find themselves pregnant and don't want to tell mum and dad, they can be sneaked off for an abortion. And so that they is hide it from the family. You hide it from the family, but I mean, that's not the only thing they're hiding from the family. Uh, the, the Ministry of Education says that teachers can uh, identify kids and give them uh, certain pronouns and that that doesn't need to be disclosed to the parents. 
Uh, so they need to find out from the child whether the child is li living a different gender at school to what they are at home. So you've got uh, gender identity, which is being hidden. You've got teenage abortion. You've got this sexual sexuality and these uh, being sexually active, which is being hidden. You've got, um, for example, whether uh, children can get the vaccine and suggesting to kids that you don't need parental involvement. But it's the parents that pick up the pieces. And once again, it comes back to this fact that the state thinks they know better how to raise our kids. And unfortunately, it, uh, if you want to know when it sort of started to it sort of started to inch its way in, it actually went back to the 70s when we sadly we had good intentions by introducing the domestic purposes benefit. But what we had was a perverse effect. And that was that uh, women no longer needed a man. They the state became the daddy. And so you could have a child without the daddy being around because the state would effectively do the same role. And so that was one of the perverse outcomes of when we reward uh, dysfunction. Sure, there are situations where there, were, where, where there was genuine need, but this is where you've got to think through policy. You've got to ask yourself, is this weakening the um, society that we want and the kind of structure that we want to put in place, which will give the best outcome for both the adults and the children. Mm. So this yeah. ideology is being pushed in schools, which which to me I consider to be um, an adult thing. It, that, that's how mm. I consider it. Um, mm. What age does a brain develop, fully develop, and we're pushing all of this stuff onto kids? I mean... I thought education was supposed to be about English and math and science. And, um, yeah, this is... Well, remember, Mel, during the uh, cannabis referendum or just before it, it was found out that the Drug Foundation were putting resources into schools, uh, talking about um, the amount of um, drugs they could carry on them yeah. uh, just, to, just to keep safe. Um, and they were also saying how to use drugs safely and to have someone there with them so that they can ring 111 uh, if they overdose. These these resources were going into high schools. I remember talking about this. I was, I was in Pyra and uh, talking at a public meeting on that and talked about these resources being in schools. And, and someone at the back who actually worked in the school said, no, no, that's complete and utter rubbish. So fortunately, I had some slides on my computer, punched them in, put them up on the screen and showed these pamphlets. Um, and, and, you know, this is the type of uh, mentality that's being pushed on our kids that you can take the risks because we will mop up after you, the state will mop up, mop up after you. But as Mel no, very well knows, the state does not make a good parent of any child. The best thing we can do is protect these kids by uh, empowering mum and dad to do their job properly, um, you know, for them to be committed to each other in their relationship. You know, look, it is an ideal. It's not always perfect because humans are involved, but we should start to aspire for what is the best model that we can follow through. But, of course, you know, for the radical left, they don't, they don't want anything to do with that type of structure and so they'll do everything to undermine it because they think the state is better, which, which of course is a Marxism. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the other the other thing that I just want to bring up, just for those who are unaware, of course, the other aspect that we have is now we have CRT or critical race theory. That is basically where white people are, are held responsible, subtly held responsible uh, for a great deal of of uh, of the problems of the world. Uh, Te Huri Hanga Nui is here. It's put, it's basically put as a a blueprint for transformative system shift. All right, so uh, this is what's going on here. What it effectively does is it slices your children up into three different races. That, of course, again is Pākehā, Tawiwi, and Māori, and uh, I think it is quite disgraceful. It goes in line with all of this co-governance, uh, uh, racist style policies that we're starting to see. The uh, Tupuna Maung Authority, the uh, the DHBs now prioritizing based off skin color. Uh, it, it's I think it's quite sort of shocking in that. Have you also done some uh, look or some research into that, Bob? 
Yeah, look, um, actually, I saw a comment from Johnny uh, who says the panel's talking in circles. We need to know what we can do. I I'd encourage you to go to our website um, because we have put together fact sheets um, and talked about parental rights um, because it is important that we get our head around this. I think, Johnny, you're right. Um, we need to uh, figure out our strategy. The first thing to do is to understand exactly what's going on. The reason that I put together the um, analysis of the sexuality and gender education and also the critical race theory and what you're talking about, Elliot, is because a lot of the stuff and, and even that, that document that you just talked about, Elliot, it was, it was snuck through. It was only revealed because people went looking for it and, and exposed it. And that, that immediately, I mean, when you know that someone is sneaking something behind your back, you immediately say, hey, what's the agenda here? Why can't you be open mm -hmm. with me? And that's the exact question I want parents to start asking schools. You need to be open with me because you are looking after my children, but they're my children, not yours. Uh, and we need to start making those demands of of schools. Um, I saw another comment that said that the mind, the brain develops by three. Actually, it's by twenty five. Uh, although in Elliot's oh, case, yeah. I think it was thirty five. But uh, twenty five, the brain right, yeah. has fully developed. <laughs> and and that was one of the arguments in the whole drug debate is that when, I mean, they were talking about uh, eighteen or twenty for trying to ban drugs and even alcohol. Um, but of course, the brain is still developing right up to 25. And yet what we're doing is we're altering uh, that whole area with drugs and, and alcohol as well. It's, it's hugely harmful. So, you know, we need to understand that our, our kids are very pliable. But that's the reason that these resources are targeted at younger and younger children, because mm. they are much more impressionable. They come home with these ideas and say to mum and dad, hey, um, apparently I'm white, so I'm bad and I need to apologise for being white and you do too, mum and dad. Or they come home and they say, look, you're calling me a boy, but actually I want to be a girl and you need to start calling me she and her or they and them or Z and Zay. Uh, you know, kids do that. Kids want to be walruses like Johnny the Walrus, the best-selling book on Amazon at the moment. Uh, and so we need, as the adults, as Mel rightly said, these are adult concepts, and we as the adults need to step in and start protecting our kids. But it's not only our kids, it's our kids' friends as well. Mm. Uh, well said, well said. Uh, I, I, I did see here, Ilo has, uh, Ilo Sione has said, uh, this needs to be sent to all Pacifica families as well, because the majority are blind to what's happening around them. Uh, so just to let you know, it is quite fascinating that Pacifica happen to be the only ethnic group who vote en masse for any party. All right, Māori are very independent. They'll choose where they want to go. Uh, so will most of the others. But Pacifica, very interesting. They'll go for the Dawn Raids Party or the Lawn, the Labour Party. So Labour Party, they are the ones who started the Dawn Raids. Most Pacifica don't know that. Uh, it is also Labour who has been at the forefront of the most anti-Christian, anti-Pacifica traditional values in the terms of their policies ever. You cannot go. And I, I have called out Alpito Seal. I have called out every single Pacifica MP that if they ever want to have a showdown, more than happy to, but they, they're quite sissy, they're quite weak and scared, and they do not come. Tell me, when was the last time that Labour Party was at one of the Forum of the Families, Bob? I'm just curious, because every other, pretty, most other parties engage with the that, that massive uh, yearly conference of Forum on the Family. Uh, yeah, to be fair, Phil Goff, when he was leader of the party, turned up. Um, we also had a couple of uh, individual Labour MPs. Um, but certainly uh, Helen Clark hasn't been there and neither has Jacinda Ardern, despite invites. But then again, um, look, I, I think you're right that um, some people do turn up and just instantly vote the box um, that their families have always traditionally done. I would encourage, especially Pacifica families, that often what they do is they turn up and they still think they're voting for David Longy. And they really need mm. to just do yeah. research into not only Labour, but the Greens, National and ACT. I mean, a lot of people think that ACT is sort of a, a right-wing party and they might be a bit more conservative and a bit more safer. If you look at their social policy, I mean, they oh, are pro-abortion, they are pro-euthanasia, they are pro-gender uh, ideology, they voted for the conversion therapy ban. 
they are not friends on the conservative mm. side. And then you think, well, okay, maybe it's national. But the problem is that national, most of national voted for the abortion law. Um, um, all of national voted for birth certificates to become just weapons of choice. So you just choose what gender is on your birth certificate, even though it's a biological fact of whether you're born male or female. And um, all but, what was it, seven, I think, or eight MPs, all but eight national MPs voted for the ban on conversion therapy of criminalizing people who want to determine how they live their life uh, and getting and getting counseling and getting prayer. So unfortunately, what we used to think was that you've got Labour and Greens on the left and you've got um, National and Act on the right. But what's happened is that in the social area, maybe not in the fiscal area, but in the social area, National and Act have started sliding. Sure. And in effect, what we have is a very left-wing government that um, that that is passing laws that the radical left are absolutely cheering. And, and uh, look, some people, we highlighted an interview that Kim Hill did on Radio New Zealand on Saturday morning, surprisingly, with uh, someone, a feminist, who was questioning the whole gender ideology and the fact that, no, there's a problem when you can just say that someone can choose to be a woman. Uh, it was a it was a great interview, um, and and what this what this lady said was um, this academic said was you know it's amazing that the politicians in New Zealand just completely railroaded through that ban on gender conversion therapy, which means effectively that if a child has gender dysphoria and says that they want to be the opposite sex, if you counsel them to say hey uh, look check check down below see what bits you've got uh, that's you were created either male or female, and that's the determinant. You are criminalized for talking like that. A counselor is criminalized. If you pray for them, uh, then you are criminalized. That's what a lot of people just don't understand um, mm. with with these types of laws that are going through. So we are we are in trouble because our parliament, on the whole, is a left wing yeah. parliament, not left wing government, left wing parliament. Mm. So solutions. <clears throat> what are some more solutions? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. And we've had Donna. Donna has also uh, said is exactly what Mal has sort of said. What do we do? Who who can we vote for? Is there is there anything that we can do? Well, the, you you certainly need that leadership at the political level, although that may be um, a bit of time coming. And I mean, you've got we've still got what eighteen months, sixteen months to the next election. Uh, my my encouragement to your viewers um, is we have to upskill ourselves and enter the debate. I think part of the reason that our parliament is leaning so far left is one because they're being championed um, by most of the mainstream media, which is why a lot of people are going to Daily Examiner and other websites which are starting to give a contrary view and and coming watching McBlog and and checking out the resources on our website so that's a good trend but mm. you know we've sort of sat back and said oh look nobody will harm our kids nobody will teach them radical stuff nobody would sneak my child off to have an abortion or sneak them off to have a vaccine without at least checking with me um you know I mean I normally I sign the form where I they have to have permission to have an aspirin if they're on school camp yeah. But yeah. now suddenly the whole um, playing field has changed. And, you know, my encouragement for for your listeners is upskill yourself on some of these issues. So, I mean, that's why we've put together fact sheets on our website so that you can do, do some basic reading and find out what you're talking about so you can enter the debate. We need more voices. We have been the silent majority for too long and we are paying the cost. And it's, it's time to speak up, be the loudest voice. And where can they find all those resources? Yeah, so it's all on familyfirst.nz, um, all, the, all the stuff that we've talked to, talked about today. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, well said. And, and again, this is, you know, this is Bob's site here. Look, this is a powerful site. I have to say, I know mm. quite a few different sites. I do go on various sites and things like that. But this is one of the best sort of uh, sites that you can actually find. You've got Family First TV with uh, one of its stars. You've got uh, Mick Blog going on, as well as Pacifically Correct. That's with Nick Duatasi, uh, the legendary youth worker from 
from years ago. Uh, and you've also got all of his research. And you'll find that Bob's research is done excellently well. It is, it's it's based on <coughs> data, empirical information that you can find. Uh, it's it's absolutely stunning what he has been able to track, or rather what the Family First team have been able to get sorted. I mean, look here, I go to fact, I go to fact sheets. And the thing is, it can't be, it cannot be denied. One of the great things that I found with Bob's website and with Bob's information is that you can't, you can fight against as much as you want. He doesn't bullcrap. He puts it out there exactly what is. You can find the stuff. He footnotes everything. He makes sure that they're all sourced well. Uh, so if you go to a site, you will be prepared. You'll be strengthened. You'll be equipped for that fight. Uh, in terms of the fight itself, I wonder if we should not be actually getting a little bit louder. Uh, I, I, you know, we, I think many of us have already talked on various things and, and we've tried to do, get the information out to the people. Uh, but I, I do, I think we need to have more road shows. We need to, I think, actually take, we need to do more change my mind stands. I think we need to, you know, engage in a real culture war idea. Um, yeah. And I, I agree. I think, the politics aspects is is difficult because we're so left leftist here. As well as might I might I submit, we do have a bit of mass formation psychosis going on in this country. Um, but I think it is quite strong. Look, we, we we've crossed over our time just a little bit, uh, and I want to just give any time for any sort of of uh, question that we've got in here. Let's see, we've got Yana. Yana has said, "Oh, sorry, that's Yana here." Does Bob get attack online in comments? So do you get Sorry? trolls. Do you get trolls, Bob. Uh, <laughs> oh, um, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, look, we've we've had a few death threats as well, um, and I've referred those to the police. For some reason, the media doesn't want to talk about those, but they'll talk about other groups that get death threats. Uh, look, it's part and parcel, and usually it's people hiding behind their keyboards, keyboard warriors. Um, yeah. I mean, actually, it's. I mean, to be honest, we we smile, uh, have a bit of fun. You got to have a good sense of humour in this. I mean, I picked up a um, answer phone message where the guy just kept on saying the f word, f you, f you, all this <laughs> type thing. So I sent it around to all the staff and said, I think this is for you, not for me. Um, you know, <laughs> you, you just have a bit of fun because you know that generally when people start abusing you, it's not. Be it's because they can't argue. Um, or debate the issue, so they've just got a name call, and mm. and I always think is when when they resort to that, then you're in the stronger position, and 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 so that's why it's interesting with all our reports, not one of them has been completely destroyed, pulled apart in the media. Um, they they can't do it, so what do they do? They just don't talk about it. They they <laughs> they ignore it. Because, you know, usually if you go after something, it's because you want to show that it's rubbish. But they haven't been able to do that. So they just, uh, they've effectively, we've been cancelled. So I guess back to your point, Elliot, is that I think what families are doing is they're starting to look for sources. I mean, we always used to sit down and, and, and the, in the, at the six o'clock to watch the news, or we all used to have the newspaper on our breakfast table. And we would take that as a source of truth. I think that at those days of way gone. Um, mm. And we are now looking for uh, sources that we can trust. Look, I think there are some websites that might say they align with our viewpoint, um, you know, the more conservative viewpoint. Uh, but I would say just, just test everything that you read. Um, verify it. Make sure it's credible. Unfortunately, some people do make claims and they're just not true. Um, and I think, you know, we just need to go out looking for for that truth. You can't uh, trust every site and you certainly can't. Unfortunately, you can't trust the mainstream media at the moment. It's really sad. I wish they were more balanced, but it's kind of like they're trying to prove to us that they're biased. Um, and it's, it's as someone who was involved in the media, I find that, you know, really sad. I remember the day after the prostitution law reform went through, so they, you know, effectively legalised prostitution in New Zealand. The next day on the breakfast show, I interviewed um, Tim Barnett, who was the architect of that, Labour MP, 
Mm. Uh, you know, and that's because you you simply want to engage with these people and hear both sides. Every week I used to talk to Helen Clark. I'm sure she hated it uh, as Prime Minister. She probably thought to herself, oh, I've got that Radio Rema interview with that Bob McCoskery again. He's not going to ask me about the latest government policy. He's going to ask me my views on moral issues like prostitution mm. and civil unions and and uh, whether I thought Jesus had been <laughs> had risen from the dead, uh, you know, and but we have to enter and in, engage and enter into those debates. So go looking yeah. for balanced media that does present both sides. So we need to, we need to educate ourselves so that we have the confidence to speak up. And, and I know we're running out of time. Just, just one other thing, um, Elliot, my favorite quote is from uh, Billy Graham, Reverend Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Yeah. And he said, when a brave person takes a stand, it stiffens the spines of others. When a brave person takes a stand, it stiffens the spines of others. And my encouragement to your viewers, you've taken time to watch this broadcast. Go and um, check out some of these sites. Go and learn a little bit more about the issues you're passionate about. Start speaking up because what you'll find out is that because of you exerting your spine a little bit, having taken some concrete pills, you'll find that people will get in behind you and start to say, hey, yeah, that's what I... Yeah, I have those same concerns. You'll be surprised. Um, and, and I think Billy Graham was exactly right. Mm. Mm. Well said. Well said. Uh, Mel, let's give you the last word there. What are your last thoughts? And then we'll, we'll finish it up. Um, I just really want to encourage families to do the simple things because this is the simple things that matter. Um, dinner time, sit down at the table as a family together, no screens, no... And, and talk. You know, if you've got teenagers at school, talk with them. Ask them what's going on at school. Ask them if they're having... It could be awfully awkward for a lot of teenagers that are, are coming, you know, across all this ideology and stuff. So engage with your youth. Have those conversations. Um, be, them, be there for them. Let them know that if they're worried or concerned or they don't think something's right at school or they feel uncomfortable, that they can come to you. They can talk to you and you can work it out. Um, so, yeah, just keep the communication going and, and stay strong as a family. Beautiful. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for everyone who's joined in. Thank you so much for your comments. Mal, Bob, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Absolute pleasure. And we will be back. We know we're going to have a bit of a fight. And I tell you what, there's more comments about that roadshow in there. Maybe that is a bit of an idea that we might engage with real soon. But in the meantime, God bless you and God bless New Zealand. Thank you.